he insisted that everybody phrase the same way. The length of notes had to be the same way, whether it was a string passage or cello passage, within the style. He had a tremendous sense of style. You could play Brahms, but when Mozart and Haydn, of course, he was especially famous for knowing the articulation required. Although he was not a string player, he understood what it takes to play Haydn and Mozart, which we play totally differently than we play the rest of the repertoire. You have to have certain articulations, and they are not marked in the music. You just have to understand how the music's supposed to sound. And if you would see some of his scores in the Zell Library, like I've seen some, because I conducted myself a few times, every single thing was meticulously marked. The viola parts was marked, the second violin parts, all the Boeing's articulations were marked. And when there was some discrepancy, he would put a note to say that's the way it's supposed to be. That was different. So he was really meticulous. He was really one of the greatest musical minds. He could play any repertoire on the piano, any work, including German music work. So he knew the repertoire totally backwards. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of music. Zell knew every note in the score. And so that's why the orchestra had this incredible unanimity of style that it played with such incredible precision and clarity and the balance. He was the master of balance. When we got to the first intermission, he said, we'll take an intermission now. Mr. Georgiadis, come to my room. And uh, all the guys looked across from the orchestra and they looked at me and they put their finger to their throat and stroked it across as much as to say, you're going the same way as the harpist. <laughs> so I went round to his room as instructed. I knocked on the door. Come in. Ah, Mr. Georgiadis. Good. You have the makings of a fine concertmaster. But you don't lead. You follow. You have to lead. I was taken aback. Nobody had ever said anything like that to me before. So I said, thank you, Dr. Zell. I said, I really would like help with that so that I can improve. Would you be kind enough to help me? Now, I think he thought for a moment that I was taking the mickey, but then he realised that I was being open and genuine, and he said, all right. He said, watch me. We go back to the rehearsal, and so I'm watching him, and he's already said to me, I'm playing with the others, I'm not leading, I'm playing late. So I start to play a little bit earlier, just a little bit, and I look expectantly at him, and he looks back, no. Oh. So I played a little bit earlier. And now I'm beginning to upset my colleagues, rather concerned. What am I doing? I'm coming in before everybody else. I look at Zell. Still, no. I cut in earlier and earlier, until I'm a good half a second before the rest of the orchestra. I'm beginning to think, well, this is crazy. What's going to happen? And eventually, Zell nods a yes so I thought okay so I stayed there I stayed in that early state in other words I'm playing now closer to the, his beat when his beat hits the deck the down part of it I'm playing closer to that 
Um, you would think that all orchestras would do that. But beats, generally speaking, are not that good. And you often find an orchestra has a safety net. It plays in a certain area after the bottom of the beat. And the orchestra gets used to how it plays like that. Well, I stayed there with Zell. And gradually, the rest of the orchestra moved up with me. And I maintain to this day, that was when the LSO started to become the prompt, exciting, on-the-beat orchestra, the live ensemble that followed. You see, it is not music director, but musical director here in Cleveland. Usually it's music director. Why is that? What's the, what's I don't the know. I found this, it is perhaps a little old-fashioned, but musical seems to indicate that the man is musical, whereas music director seems to indicate simply that he directs music. And these two things are not identical, mind you. George Zell on WCLV in 1967. He was talking to Martin Perlich, whom he took a liking to, unlike how he often could be with interviewers. By this time, he felt that in the Cleveland Orchestra he was fulfilling his decades of aspiration for perfection, and he often gave high praise to the players in public, like when Martin Perlich asked him about the European tour he had just completed with them. It was fantastic. It was, it, if possible, topped all the successes we had had previously on our tour. It was very characteristic because in... On previous tours, we played for an audience in one country, whereas playing in these European festival cities, you play for an international audience that has gathered from all of these countries. So it was a cross-section, a very international cross-section, with a good deal of native audience, particularly in Edinburgh. And but it, was, there, it was up to and, and, and surpassed even the... Uh, the Russian tour. Yes, recently. yes, absolutely, and that's extraordinary. Also, the, the most amazing critical evaluations, both as to enthusiasm and also as to quality and level of both language and knowledge. <laughs> 